So firstly, a very warm welcome to everybody. Thank you for taking the time to join this webinar. Um, so it's a joint AGG EIB webinar on genetic gains. Um, so the structure for the next couple of hours is on the screen. I hope you can all see the screen. Uh, we will have some opening remarks from uh, the leadership from CIMIT and IITA. Uh, and then we have three speakers who will be talking about various aspects of uh, genetic gain. Um, so Eduardo Kuvarubias um, and Yung Wa Lee from Excellence in Breeding and Yosef Beeni from the Global Maze Program at CIMIT. Um, there will be opportunities to ask questions to each of the presenters uh, right after they present. So uh, we welcome your participation. We're actively looking for your, we're looking for your active participation. So you can either raise your hand to ask a question through video or uh, please um, type your question into the chat. Uh, and we will relay that um, to the presenters. So my name is Bish Das. I work with the Excellence in Breeding Platform and together with Dan Makumbi, um, who is with CIMIT Global Maze Program, we will host and, and facilitate the discussion today. Um, so in terms of housekeeping, I think we're all Zoom experts now. So unless you are speaking, please put your mic on mute uh, and then also feel free to put your video um, to switch off your video if you're not speaking in order to um, conserve your bandwidth. Uh, and again, please actively use the chat. So any queries and questions that are coming up, please put them in there. Uh, so with that, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Dr. Prasanna. Uh, he's, uh, as many of you know, the director of the Global Maze Program of CIMIT. Um, so we'd like to turn it over to you, Dr. Prasanna, to set the scene, uh, make some opening remarks uh, and, and launch the webinar. So over to you, Prasanna. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bish. And a very, very warm welcome to all the colleagues who are participating in this webinar on uh, enhancing and measuring uh, genetic gain in crop breeding. Uh, this is uh, one of the series that we have been organizing under the AGG project, the Accelerated Genetic Gains for Maize and Wheat Improvement, uh, a project that is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, USAID, and FFAR. Uh, it's a successor project in case of maize uh, for the drought tolerant maize for Africa, which was followed by uh, the stress tolerant maize for Africa STMA project. Uh, so this project AGG uh, has been launched in, uh, on, uh, in, on April 1st, 2020 this year. So uh, it's uh, already exciting to have again uh, the partners from 13 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, continuing with this uh, extremely productive partnership uh, that focuses on increasing genetic gains in maize uh, and uh, developing and deploying uh, impactful varieties uh, in each of those geographies uh, that we are serving under this project. Uh, the importance of genetic gains and uh, uh, the concept and the guidelines will be uh, elaborated in detail by Eduardo uh, soon after uh, John De Herrera's uh, comments uh, from the industry perspective. Uh, John, of course, is presently in IATA. Uh, but just to, to quickly recap why we are doing this uh, webinar. Uh, it, is, it is important that uh, each, any of the breeding programs we are talking about uh, the fundamental uh, aim is to improve the populations genetically, whether it is crop breeding programs or animal breeding program. Uh, the main aim is to improve the populations genetically and to develop impactful products. Uh, a breeder indeed makes genetic gain uh, when the selected individual or individuals have a better combination of genes uh, that contribute to the traits of interest uh, in a product profile. Then the unselected individuals within the same population. Uh, the breeder therefore wants to maximize this genetic improvement, which we call as genetic gain or selection response while minimizing any of the negative traits that could get associated uh, in the genetic improvement process. Uh, so therefore systematically measuring genetic gain enables the breeding programs to critically analyze the efficiency of the breeding approaches and uh, how to plan new actions and strategies to accelerate or to drive genetic gains. Uh, in other words, it's a, a very critical tool that enables us to allocate resources wisely uh, between different breeding programs or between different breeding approaches that we may plan to implement. 
So three questions are fundamentally important here. Uh, we need to understand what are the specific factors that could contribute uh, to higher genetic gains in crop breeding programs. How can one influence those factors uh, in the breeding program to contribute to accelerated genetic gains? And how can we precisely predict the genetic response of the individuals in the populations? So therefore, uh, genetic gain depends uh, on a number of factors. Most importantly, the availability of heritable variation for the target traits uh, in the breeding populations, uh, the selected fraction of the population uh, to be parents of the next generation. That's what we call line recycling in breeding programs. And, and the time frame for, collect, uh, for completing a, a breeding cycle or a selection cycle. Uh, that means shortening the breeding cycle uh, will, uh, will naturally enhance the genetic gains in breeding programs. So therefore we can, uh, uh, we, we need to focus on selection accuracy here, uh, especially the phenotyping uh, accuracy, increasing the selection intensity, which is really important if we have to make rapid genetic gains, enhancing the functional genetic variation uh, for the traits of interest and uh, undertaking approaches that can significantly shorten uh, the generation advancement or breeding cycle. So uh, in, in the previous webinars under the AGG project, we covered some of those most important aspects. For example, we organized a webinar on high throughput and precision phenotyping. Uh, another webinar focused on genomics assisted breeding uh, for maize improvement. Uh, in a third webinar, we talked about uh, continuous improvement of breeding programs. Uh, in another webinar, we, uh, thanks to COVID-19, we had a series of online webinars. The fourth webinar focused on accelerated varietal turnover. Ultimately, we would like to see that the predicted genetic gains are also realized uh, at the farmer level, and there is uh, uh, a contribution uh, to the on-farm productivity uh, in those target geographies. So that's the most important aspect, not just having uh, improvement of genetic gains in the breeding programs, but translating these genetic gains uh, to the farmer's fields. Therefore, the farmer has the benefit of fighting the most important diseases and pests that could uh, destabilize productivity or have an improved ways of uh, our resilience uh, with regard to the abiotic stresses like drought, heat, water logging, or combinations of uh, such stresses. So we have an excellent panel today. Uh, we have John Derrera, who is going to give uh, the perspective from the industry, which he's heard for many years with regard to improving genetic gains. Eduardo uh, from the Excellence in Breeding Platform is going to talk more elaborately on genetic gain, the concepts, the importance, and the guidelines. And Yangwa Lee, uh, again from the Excellence in Breeding Platform, uh, will focus on genetic gain assessment in practice, uh, taking a particular case study of Carl Rose Maze, uh, Highland Maze Program. And Yosef Bien, my colleague um, in the CIMIT Global Maze Program, um, uh, based in Nairobi, uh, will talk about how CIMIT Maze Breeding Program in Eastern and Southern Africa took a systematic approach to improve genetic gains. And today we are very proud that we have reached almost 1.75% to 2% uh, um, genetic gain annually uh, in, um, in the stress prone environments of Eastern and Southern Africa uh, through systematic integration of various tools, including double haploidy, uh, high throughput phenotyping, uh, precision phenotyping, having harmonized protocols with the national programs uh, with regard to phenotyping, undertaking extensive on-stage non-farm testing, and uh, integrating genomics-assisted uh, breeding as a part of our uh, breeding strategy. So with that, uh, thanks a lot once again for giving me this opportunity to launch this very important webinar, and uh, looking forward to a very exciting webinar and a very highly informative presentations from all the colleagues. Uh, now, over to you, back uh, to you, Bish. Okay, Th thanks very much, Prasanna, for that, um, for those words of welcome and for setting the scene um, so comprehensively and um, emphasizing it. We want to see the genetic gains translated to, to farmers' fields too. 
Um, so uh, at this point, we'd like to hand it over to uh, Professor Derrera. Um, so Professor Derrera, if you'd like to share some perspective from industry, um, uh, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Ish. Uh, uh, this afternoon, I'm making some remarks uh, from the perspective of the industry. But I'm now with the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture, a new affiliation. Next slide, please. What I want to emphasize is from the private sector point of view, the major goal for breeding uh, is motivated by the need to maximize grower value. The belief is that if you maximize grower value, you grow your market share and you attain a repeat business. Uh, that's the base of the private sector concept. But I've tried to coin an equation here uh, to try and illustrate some components that, are pay, that they pay attention to uh, in measuring genetic gain. Uh, yield potential is very important, and there are also defensive traits that uh, may be required. This reflects on the need to coin in issues to do with abiotic stress tolerance, biotic stress tolerance, and also what is called the input traits. This one reflects on the ability to enable the farmers who grow the variety to practice high level management. This may include, say, herbicide resistance in maize. There are some varieties that are susceptible even to common herbicides, not, not only uh, Roundup Ready. So that is very important that variety is amenable uh, to high level management. This also may include ability to manipulate plant populations, to achieve higher yield, and to use less land. Then comes another element, which is the output traits. In these elements, we are looking at quality traits, the gender traits, and also nutritional traits. This might be the amount of vitamin A in the grain, the protein content. They may be required situations whereby growers will get a premium uh, for quality. Or at the household level, they may require some sweet uh, varieties for their domestic use. So attention is paid on the output traits as well. And of course, there have always been other agronomic traits that may require attention. It may be secondary things like the maturity dates, it might be crucial. You can see that most of these elements can be bred in the variety. So a lot of the work is done within the variety. But I must emphasize as well that you have to minimize some cryptic factors uh, that are difficult to control, of course, and side effects uh, that may come as a result of management of the crop. All those things take away the yield. Let me see the, the last slide. In my last slide, I want to talk about uh, potential yield. If you see in the equation above of genetic gain, you have featured in the yield potential is a very important component uh, that the private sector looks at. This is attained when the best variety is grown and emphasize that there is need to grow the most recent variety. So varietal turnover is quite important in this regard because that is the most adapted variety that is on the, that should be on the market. It should be the most recent variety. Best agronomic management is implied and also manageable abiotic and abiotic stress factors should be minimized. And the variety is, should be grown under the same natural resource base and cropping systems as the target region of production. There are implications uh, for these statements that I've just made here. It implies that in measuring genetic gain in the private sector, we pay attention to effective benchmarking. In most cases, the top three to four varieties for the market segment that they are targeting are included in the in measuring genetic gain. And in most cases, they also have to include in the newest best variety. It may not have been commercialized yet, but it reflects on the genetic gains from the genetic perspective. 
Also, looking at the elements in the equation, it's more than yield. It's need to meet minimum thresholds for each of the elements. This might depend on the target environment. In some marketing segments, they pay more attention to quality than yield. So all those factors uh, have to meet the minimum thresholds. Continuous improvement is implied in the sense that genetic gain has to be sustainable and can only be sustained through continuous improvement of the variety. There is no magical variety that to have the highest level for each of the elements in the equation. So that implies that improvement has to be done continuously. Varietal turnover policy is implied in this case, and farmers have to change the variety to get the newest that is on the market so that they realize the genetic gains that have been achieved. My last point, I emphasize that it has to be measured under the same natural resource base and cropping systems as the target region of production. Therefore, genetic gain should be tested on farm in the target market where the variety would be grown. These are the major elements uh, that are considered by the industry. Thank you very much, Fish. Thank you. Thanks very much, John. Thanks very much for that and for sharing those insights and perspective from industry. Uh, and very interesting to see both you and Prasanna emphasizing variety turnover on farm as a, as a key priority as well. So thank you very much, um, John, and thank you very much, Prasanna. Um, so now we're ready to um, get into um, the first of our presentations. So it's really a pleasure to uh, welcome and introduce Dr. Eduardo Cuvarubias. Uh, Eduardo leads module two in excellence in breeding, which um, uh, focuses on optimization of breeding schemes um, and um, quantitative genetics. So um, with that, I'd like to hand over to you, Eduardo. Thanks, Bish. Thank you, uh, can you hear me well? I'm trying to share my screen. Please let we me know if you can well see it. And, and we can see the screen too. Okay, great. Uh, sorry that I'm not sharing my video, but... Uh, I've been having bad internet connection these days, so I want to minimize the, the collateral damage. Good. Okay, so uh, let's start. Uh, thanks for giving me the first slot. Hello, everyone. And thanks for joining this session on concepts, uh, methods, and recommendations for the estimation of the rate of response to selection or genetic gain, aka genetic trend. I hope it's not too basic for you. And um, let me just uh, start this presentation by sharing a short story with you about uh, Richard Feynman uh, that you may have heard before, this famous theoretical physicist involved in the Manhattan Project. Um, this story is in the 40s when the Richard was a young man, uh, fresh out of college. He was touring the site, later to be known as Los Alamos, where the Manhattan Project uh, you know, would produce the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He was there as a member of the scientific team that worked in tandem with the military to construct uh, those facilities that were necessary to refine and process atomic weapon grade materials. So during his first visit uh, to this secret facility in the early phases of construction, uh, Richard was at one point introduced to a team of engineers standing around a large table uh, that was full of uh, laid out blueprints showing critical components of the project, plumbing systems to contain and control, you know, the extremely hot gases and dangerous pressures that are uh, that supposed to pass through those plumbing systems. So key to their concerns, of course, they were designing redundant systems. So or if they were losing all control, the system uh, would form some sort of closed system. So uh, the story says that they started showing and explaining these blueprints to Richard, who was trying to keep up with the engineers who were talking really fast while showing Richard this labyrinth of paths and flipping through the blueprints one after another. So, so Richard begins to realize that he had no idea what they were talking about. So worse than that, he didn't even know what the little symbols on the blueprints were. So there were a lot of little squares with X's in, in them and Richard thought that they might be bulbs, but he could not be sure by this time because he had taken too long to ask. So, he thought that he would feel uh, stupid if he ha had asked that question and, and, and they, that would reveal his ignorance. So Richard, instead of, ran instead of doing that, he randomly pointed out to one of the probably hundreds of little squares that were in the blueprint. And then he said, so what if this valve gets stuck? T 
thinking that at least that would steer the conversation in the direction where he could make sense of everything. So the team of engineers got together and they started tracing the connections through the mountains of drawings and, and blueprints. And after um, checking, uh, they conferred to each other and, and the lead technician said, you're absolutely right, sir. This valve is misplaced. What you've done is incredible. You are a genius. And all that Richard was trying to do was just to find out if the boxes with excess in them were valves or not. The point that I'm trying to make is that most of us will not be as, luck, as lucky as Richard. So if you are not understanding something, please just ask and, and don't wait until you feel that it's too late. So what we are going to look in this brief presentation is um, what is genetic gain? What are some decisions that should be considered when estimating this metric? And some guidelines to set the scene for Yongwa showing a practical example. But first, uh, why we want to estimate genetic gain? Uh, it's just very quick, the CG and NARS programs and many other organizations are moving towards a more data-driven culture where decisions are not taken anymore based on gut feeling Decisions that can affect the sustainability and the development of the organizations need to be based on facts. And data, good data, is a good way to infer those facts. So this naive image uh, in the background shows five stages towards a data-driven culture, where most, where most of the organizations are only, or normally in the first three, where they either deny the power of the data or they have the data, but they don't use it for driving decisions. What we aim is to move this to the stage four and five, where the data is actually used to back important decisions. And, and this is one of the reasons why we are trying to use the data uh, to get this metric on genetic gain to influence decisions. So together with adopting a data-driven culture, it's important to understand our business as a process. The big advantage of understanding breeding as a process is that by defining uh, all these different sub processes that in steps that we, we can evaluate the performance of the different steps and identify where the important improvements are required. We can install uh, metrics in each uh, uh, or KPIs, key performance indicators in the different components of the process. Uh, when looking at this high level representation uh, that I put in the background of the breeding process, you might be able to identify in, in which particular steps or step of the process you mainly contribute in your organization. It might be in the design of the products. It might be in the engineering of the products. Uh, you can call it differently, maybe the population improvement, product development, or you might be more involved in the delivery of the, pro the products. So, once the sub-processes have been identified, this is just a different view of the same image, same image uh, you can link them to different tasks and decisions that occur at each step of the process. The point that I'm trying to do with this image is that there is different levels that you can use to describe uh, these uh, components of the process. Go to high level, lower level, so you can come up with more detail on the different tasks and decisions. And this can help us develop the right KPIs or key performance indicators to monitor whether the process is occurring in an efficient way or it needs additional improvements. Here is where the rate of genetic gain shows up. Oh, sorry, the genetic gain shows up as a high level KPI to monitor the process as a whole. The compendium of all tasks and decisions that the breeding program does, they can be reflected in, in, in the genetic gain. On the other hand, you could develop other KPIs for specific sub-processes. For example, the repeatability of the trials could be used as a KPI to, moni to monitor the effectiveness of the evaluation um, sub-process, maybe here in the engineering, and you can evaluate whether the design and planting went well, the phenotyping went well, et cetera, et cetera. But you can always develop additional KPIs uh, for more detailed processes. So, Going back to the, the comments from, from, uh, from Prasanna, so first I would like to uh, uh, start this discussion on where the genetic gain comes from. Uh, so when we talk about the rate of response to selection or genetic gain, um, we refer to the change in breeding value or genetic value 
that is occurring for a particular trait of interest in a period of time. The genetic trend is, is just that. I mean, when you said the genetic trend, you, you refer to the actual trend uh, that you can observe over many cycles. This can be linear or nonlinear. And really is, is when the genetic trend is linear that you can actually calculate the genetic gain or the rate of response to selection that occurs for, um, uh, like we, have, we were mentioning before, a trait or an index of traits. Uh, is normally expressed in percentage or in the normal units of the trait. Um, as, as John was mentioning, and, and we will expand later, uh, it could be one trait, it could be many traits. That's really the decision that you need to um, come up with your stakeholders. So three things that I would like to emphasize is that it's, it's important to point out that genetic gain is only understood in a population basis. There is no genetic gain for a single individual. That doesn't exist. This is a population genetics uh, um, concept. So that's why you normally observe all those images in distributions. Uh, second, uh, given the first condition of, of, genetic, uh, of genetic gain, I mean, also it has to be understood in the context of a relatively closed system or a recurrent selection system. And I will go a bit uh, deeper in the next slide. Uh, something else to point out is that it, it really comes from the increase in the frequency of alleles responding positively to a particular uh, a natural or simulated environmental condition. So when you see those distributions and you see that the frequency of uh, the positive alleles are increasing here, of course, I'm just showing one single gene. Um, it, th that's where the genetic gain comes from. So if you are not thinking on populations and you are not thinking on the frequency of alleles, probably what you are expressing might not be actually genetic gain. Let me move to the next one. Uh, this one is just to uh, emphasize again, the, uh, this part of what is not a uh, rate of response to selection or genetic gain. I want to emphasize this part because some programs might be in a scenario number one, where they have some collection of germoplasm they make certain crosses, normally using the same parents over and over again. And after many years, they identify some promising material. And they call the difference between the promising material, this good genotype, and the original population genetic gain. That is not really genetic gain. Like I mentioned before, genetic gain comes from a formal recurrent selection system in an elite gene pool with a focus on population improvement that the aims to increase the frequency of positive alleles. So keep that in mind when you try to, uh, to obtain genetic gains in your program. Okay, so let's introduce the, the, the concepts. Um, or the, the first time that people that was talking about genetic gain was originally called response to selection, and I will see the, the link. Uh, when Jay Lush in the 30s was the leveraging from the development of uh, Sir Ronald Fisher, Haldane, Sewell Wright, the titans of quantitative genetics. Um, and he developed, J. Lush, uh, what he would call, or what would be called later, the breeder's equation or response to selection. So the, the between generation change in genetic means. So you can see in this figure that there is an original mean of the population. There is another generation that has a different, uh, a different, different genetic mean, and the difference between those two means is the, um, the response to selection. But let's go step by step, let's go by parts. Let's take a look at 1A. I hope this is not too, uh, too much, but I think it would be interesting to understand how this equation was derived. Some of you have probably seen this uh, slide before. So in, in 1A, you can express the phenotype, let's call it Y for a minute, as a linear function of uh, a mean or an intercept called mu, a genotype effect, in this case called G, and an error called E in this case. This is the single phenotype scenario that was used to derive it. In 1B, you can actually rearrange the same equation to be seen in terms of the genotype instead of terms of the phenotype, where you can see that the genotype is a function of the actual phenotype minus the, the mean of the population, and this is multiplied by a slope that accounts for the error, the typical slope in a regression model. So once we see it in this way, we know actually that the slope of a regression is calculated as the covariance of two variables over the variance of the response variable. 
in this case, uh, X is the genotype effect. Here I'm calling it A, ignoring the non-additive components, and Y is the, the phenotype. If you work out the, this uh, normal covariance, uh, and you would see that the, the covariance between the, the, the A uh, or the genotype effect and the phenotype is the covariance of, um, again, the genotype plus uh, genotype error. Um, and this, you can actually uh, equate the, the second to zero, the covariance between the genotype and the error. And therefore you end up with the covariance of the genotype with the genotype and the covariance of the same variable is the variance of the variable. So you end up with the variance of the genotype, variance of the phenotype, which is the heritability. So, so we know that actually this slope is the heritability. If we select a subset of the population, now instead of uh, you start thinking in terms of selection, you can uh, create this new variable, let's call it just uh, G with an asterisk. Uh, now the genotype mean is, 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 the, is the similar um, equation, but uh, for that subpopulation here in 1D. I don't want to make this uh, too, too complicated, but if you take the expectations, instead of just using the normal variables, you, you change this to be means. Uh, so you have the mean of the selected fraction, you have the mean of the original population, and you just have to rearrange some of these terms. For example, take the original mean, move it to the, to the left side, and, and that's how you end up that uh, the mean of the new population minus the mean of the original population is the response to selection, as we stated in the graph. And then this is equal to the slope, which is the heritability, and the mean of the selected fraction minus the mean of the uh, original population. That's what we call as the selection differential. So that is how the, the first uh, form of the breeder's equation is actually derived. And if, if you actually want to go further, uh, you might know that the heritability, I mean, can be expressed in terms of the variance components or in terms of the standard deviations. So if you actually change it to the standard deviations and you plug it into the response to selection equation, you can actually take one of those uh, standard deviations for the phenotype, sorry, and move it to the, uh, to the denominator um, um, of the selection differential, and that's how you actually obtain the standardized selection differential or selection intensity. And you can always take two of these standard deviations, which are the square root of the heritability, and this one stands alone. Uh, if you are related to the quantitative genetics theory, you know that normally the, the, the square root of the heritability is also known as the accuracy in the single phenotype scenario. And that's how you end up with the, with the two most popular uh, parameterizations of the, of the response to selection. And of course, when, when you put that in the context of time, that's uh, what is called uh, the genetic gain, when you divide all that by the, the cycle time. Good. So that was the first time that, um, that we uh, started talking about uh, the response to selection, genetic gain, when we were talking with respect to time or cycle time. Uh, but once you have data for more than one cycle of recurrent selection, you can move to see that uh, what is the realized genetic gain, not only the expected gain, as, as you could calculate with the previous equation, that actually relies on many assumptions. Um, some of the most uh, complicated assumptions is, is, is actually that the, the, it needs to be in the first generation of selection to be accurate and, um, and, and many others that makes it difficult to really implement in practice. It can be good to use it as a quick indicator to make sure that you're, you're making uh, uh, progress or you might be making progress, but the, the ideal way to do it is to really look at the realized genetic gain. The principle is the same. As we saw before, you need the genetic means or, or breeding value means, depending on what are you looking at, for the trait or index of interest to see the response to selection, the realized response to selection, and calculate the, the genetic gain. The procedure, of course, is, is very simple. Uh, you have to generate the data. So and this is important to notice because um, the, the genetic gain metric is, is always uh, put in a context. You need to put it in the context of a specific ma market segment that you have a pipeline that is serving and a breeding scheme that is used to derive the products, whatever that product is, a population, a variety, a line, a hybrid, a clone. It's really the trial information, um, the data that will be used for estimating genetic gain 
so as an output, you get the phenotypes for the different stages, for the different um, years uh, when you are trying to generate the data. So then you, uh, you can move to analyze, uh, sorry, to subset that, that data. And uh, let's say for that particular market segment, you are uh, deciding that you want to uh, focus on the trial data from the on-farm trials. You could have picked something else depending on your interest. And you decide that the time window, uh, let's say is going to be uh, the last 10 years. So year one to year 10, as we are pointing out there. Um, and of course, this is always looking at the specific, like I said, trait or, or set of traits in an index. Um, you, you look at a specific stage, we pointed that out in, in, in time. Um, finally, you take those adjusted means and, and regress them by their year of release, year of creation, cycle, or another time unit of interest that tells you how much gain you are having per unit of time. So normally that is just uh, the, the last steps. Uh, you, you, like I said, you analyze the data, you obtain the, uh, the adjusted means for that particular stage across years, and that is used for a final regression with respect to time to obtain the genetic gain. Um, it's advisable to keep it uh, in, in the real units or percentage with respect to the original population instead of expressing it with respect to a specific material or check, since the genetic materials uh, are environment dependent uh, and, and they, they might bias the interpretation of this, um, of this particular metric. Um, some experts, of course, have referred to the fact that, um, uh, like I said, it's important to keep in mind that only the, the rate of gain or well, the rate of response to selection or genetic gain can be calculated if the genetic trend is linear. So something to keep in mind um, when, the, when doing this type of analysis. And uh, maybe I forgot to mention, when you look at the genetic trend, I mean, there is also non-genetic trends that can be attributable to, uh, to other environmental factors uh, and, and management conditions. I will not go in, deep, uh, or in depth in this slide. I just wanted to say that uh, this is a summary from uh, the variation of the different methods available for uh, estimating genetic gain. And, and this summary can be found in the optimization manuals from the Excellence in Breeding Toolbox. So you can always uh, take a look there. If you have some additional time later, you can see that here we refer to the expected, the realized, and, and the different variations, what type of data is required, and some particular recommendations that we will discuss in a minute. So to summarize, uh, please keep in mind that um, uh, that these decisions that I'm going to, uh, to share with you uh, are, are uh, something that you may want to ask yourself or, or consider when estimating the, the genetic gain. You need to, to check if you, have if you have clarity on the market segment and pipeline that we are talking about, that we are going to, to monitor with this metric. So you may also want to check uh, which trait we want to use to infer um, the development or progress in this market segment. Uh, it has been highly criticized in the past and I think even today, um, why only yield? Uh, I mean, we are not telling you that it has to be yield. That's something that you and your stakeholders have to agree on. And it can be yield, it can be something else. It can be an, an index of multiple traits as John was actually pointing out that it, that would happen in the ideal scenario. Um, number three, uh, so we, you need to also ask yourself, okay, which germoplasm stage reflects better our target customer? So, and some, uh, this is kind of difficult for the programs because they may want to use the on-farm trials uh, as the data or the, or the germoplasm stage sample. Uh, but the truth is that for many programs, the, the um, farther away in the pipeline, the, the, the germoplasm means is, is less under their own control. So some of the programs opt for estimating the, the rate of gain using materials from stage one, stage two, stage three, et cetera, instead of the on-farm trials. But ideally, of course, uh, you would look to, uh, for a particular stage that is closer to your target customer. Uh, point four, uh, you need to think carefully which period of time are you interested in, in examining. I mean, it's not just... Uh, uh, something random I and mean, you may want to check how it's uh, behaving in the last 10 years. You may, be, uh, you may want to see it in, in the last five. I mean, you may want to identify how the, the trends are changing. Maybe at some point they, they were linear and now they are not. 
Um, so this is something to consider as well. Uh, point five, uh, how you will produce the data to monitor the progress is something that is highly critical and we will go in, in a minute in that part. You can run explicit error trials to generate that information or you can rely on, on the historical trial information to, uh, to, to calculate the metric. That's something that uh, we can discuss in a minute. And point six, uh, last but not least, uh, also check what is the best suited method to calculate the genetic gain or rate of response to selection given the data available. I mean, the, of course, we refer to mixed models, but there is always variations, one step, two step, or you might want to use the, the relationship matrix to adjust or, or to face the connectivity issues. So that's something also to check if you, you have the, the, um, the people that can do uh, those analysis. Okay, so, so what makes a good estimate of the rate of genetic gain. So it needs to be accurate. So that is close to the true value because you can have, of course, uh, if you think about it, different types of accuracy. Uh, but you also need this um, metric to be precise. So this is not only close to the real value, but also not to spread. So you kind of want to get really precise and accurate. You want to be in this side but also you want this to be cheap to produce. You don't want to invest a lot of resources every year to generate the data, reduce it, analyze it, and calculate the genetic gain. You want to identify what is the cheapest way to produce this metric and that is still being accurate and precise. Good. So what are the guidelines that Excellence in Breeding is providing together with Crops and Hunger to maximize the accuracy, precision, and, and, and reducing the, uh, the cost? So the most important recommendation is to maximize the connectivity. The connectivity of the data that um, this is to make sure that the adjusted means that you will be using for the calculation will remove the location, year, and location by year effects as best as possible. And that can only be achieved by having connectivity in the germoplasm. So that means, uh, for example, having a, um, a good uh, check strategy and also a good check replacement strategy. So fixing a certain percentage of checks at different stages, having common checks across all years and replacing checks depending on how long the cycle time is are some of the recommendations that we have been providing. Uh, you can check more detail on the Excellence in Breeding Manual again in the toolbox that I referred before. Uh, but this, is, this image is, is showing that a good check replacement strategy and how to allocate uh, a different amount of checks depending on the stage and kind of by fixing certain percentage of the entries to be checks. And that uh, as the breeding scheme keeps uh, moving, of course, that uh, represents that you need to have less and less checks. That is understandable. You don't want to have uh, 10 materials and, and 10 checks. I mean, that's, that's just uh, ridiculous. Uh, so, so you want to adapt to have a good, just have a good check strategy um, to make sure that not only genetic gain, but other um, important analysis can be conducted by uh, achieving this connectivity. The second recommendation um, to maximize the accuracy and precision is just to make sure that the trial data that is being used, it represents properly the locations and environments of our target population of environments or TPE defined in the market segment. For that, you may want to think twice uh, which testing stage or stages you want to use for the calculation uh, and even look back at your testing strategy. This is because the, um, you want to make sure that the, 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 the metric is representing the, um, the particular environmental conditions that, um, that your customers will be facing. My, just think for a minute that uh, maybe the program uh, only makes a stage one in one location in the home location where the center is, and then they calculate the rate of response to selection or genetic gain, and then it looks fantastic. But that is a metric that would not represent um, really the, the TPE that this uh, particular pipeline is targeting. So uh, that is something that you may want to always look back as your testing strategy, make sure that um, the data used is facing those conditions. Um, 
the guideline to minimize the cost of estimating the rate of response to selection uh, or, or genetic gain is to use the trial information that your breeding program actually produces normally instead of running explicit uh, trials like error trials um, to, estimate this, to estimate this metric. This, of course, depends on whether you have good connectivity strategy or not. You can only use the trial data if you can connect the, uh, um, if you can connect the data. Um, so in this case, the estimate uh, of rate of response to selection using ETA trials or historical trials can be equally as good if the connectivity is good. But if the connecti connectivity is not good or doesn't exist, really the estimates of these two methods will be very, very different. Um, and, and you might not uh, want to rely on historical information. Uh, there is a couple of tricks to, to create that connectivity using the relationship matrix of the, of the individuals, but that is still not be as good as, as, as expected. Okay, so to finalize, I don't want to make this longer. Uh, Excellence in Breeding uh, recommends to, uh, most of the programs to start adopting a good check strategy. That's the first thing that you should be thinking on. A, a good also check replacement strategy. You can start maybe doing an era trial um, or this experiment, uh, that's how they call them, uh, to create some sort of baseline or using the EBB method, which is the, the relationship matrix to maybe have a second baseline because you cannot, uh, you cannot um, achieve to pay an error trial and you have pedigree information. And as the time passes and the connectivity increases, uh, you need to move towards estimating this, this metric or genetic gain using the phenotypic data from the regular trials um, that your program uh, produces when in the testing stages in order to make it cheaper. Okay, so like I said, that's uh, everything from my side. Um, I guess we can move to the Q&A session. Uh, sorry if I exceeded a little bit the time. So Bish, uh, hand it to you for starting the Q&A. Okay, thanks a lot, Eduardo. Uh, thanks very much for the, for the comprehensive presentation, both on the theory, but also some very tangible steps that, uh, and practical steps that programs can start taking immediately. Um, so I'll, I'll go through the chat. I see one question there in the chat. I'll read it out. For those of you who would like to ask your question live, you can do so. Please press participants on the, towards the bottom of the tab. Uh, a list of names will come up on the right and on the bottom right um, hand corner of the screen is an option to raise your hand. So you can actually raise your hand and, and ask the question directly. Uh, and I see someone has already done so, uh, Paul Gibson. But first I'll start with the chat. Um, yep. So Mary is asking Eduardo, is it possible to use some dummy data to go through the calculation step by step? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So yeah, 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 yeah. So so first, uh, you can find those dummy examples, uh, or I like to call them Mickey Mouse examples, um, in the in the toolbox of excellence in breeding. Together with the manual, there is a link to to um, to code uh, that has some sample data to show the different ways to calculate genetic gain using these example data sets. Uh, and I think uh, Yong Wa will actually go exactly on that question. We'll, we'll show a step-by-step -step, um, procedure to calculate genetic gain. So I think those are two resources that might be useful for answering that question. Thanks, Eduardo. Um, Paul, please go ahead with your question. Thank you, uh, and I'll get my video going. The, sorry for the time delay there. So my question is related to breeding uh, crops where you're doing pure lines or other things where you're not actually using recurrent selection. Uh, do you have some materials or recommendation on prog measuring progress of the breeding program over time when you're not using recurrent selection, but you're simply looking at the improvement in the pure line products or inbreds that you're bringing out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question, Paul. Thanks. Um, indeed, uh, well, first of all, there can be uh, line crops that actually use recurrent selection. For example, the ones that use, I don't know, SSD, they derive certain lines or single, or, sorry, SSD means single seed descent. You derive certain lines, they are tested, 
and maybe at the first stage, second stage or third stage, they are actually recycled to become the parents of the new generation. That is, still is a recurrent selection um, in population improvement. Uh, of course, some programs have relied on more like pedigree type of methods where they just derive sublines and those good materials, they, they are just improved, improved by bringing additional traits. Um, there's really, like I said at the beginning, that is not really uh, a population improvement approach. Uh, and, and that also normally is not also a population uh, focused approach. So the, really the genetic gain and rate of response to selection doesn't make too much sense on that part. It's a different strategy to obtain products. And that actually maps back, and thanks for asking that, Paul, to the, to the philosophy of deriving products. There is, uh, I guess, several philosophies, but the, the ones that I, I would say that are the strongest these days is the one that Paul is, is, is uh, referring to. So uh, deriving some good individuals and just trying to improve those specific lines by adding some um, new traits, or the, the one that the Crops to End Hunger uh, initiative is promoting that is also existing in many, many programs uh, in, in the past and also in, in some of the CG programs, which is population improvement. Um, really population improvement as a source to, to derive products. So trying to move the population means for all the trades as fast as possible, uh, moving the means and in, in, in the distributions in order to increase the likelihood of identifying uh, good products. Um, normally, the population improvement approach uh, approaches take a couple of generations to to really produce um, these good products to really increase the likelihood. Um, but that actually pays off. We are, that's why we promote uh, more that approach instead of the the first one, um, which is good, but it can get stuck. Remember that in in this case, you are just bringing more traits, um, but in, in, but somehow you. you uh, you move slower later on and the population improvement approach maybe starts moving slower at the beginning, but you can actually move um, the, from the initial mean of the distribution, many standard deviations to the right side or to the left side, depending on, on, the, um, on the directionality of the trait. Um, you can look at many different studies. I mean, you can move five, 10, even 20 standard deviations from the original mean. I mean, you would see values that you would never observe if you don't make population improvement. So that is the magic of managing populations and increasing the frequency of positive alleles. So, so yeah, I guess, the, I don't know if I help with my answer, Paul, but I think your question is very relevant to this audience. Okay. Thanks, Eduardo, and thanks, Paul, for, for that question. I think we've a couple of minutes left before we have to hand over to Yungwa. Um, so I see a number of questions in the chat. I'll just pick two out, uh, Eduardo. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, Ekanem is asking how many years of data is required to calculate genetic gain. Uh, and then Ramesha is asking, you know, how do you give uh, weights, uh, trait weights uh, for yield? How do you give weights for yield and other traits? What is the yep. basis for that? So, yep. So on the first one, on how many years of data, um, like I said, there is two different types of genetic gain, the expected and the realized. For the expected, you don't need more than the, the, the current year of data that you are using. So you would use the reader's equation to derive it. You would see what was the heritability. You would see what is the selection differential, and then you can actually calculate what is the response to selection. Um, on the other hand, uh, um, when you want to look at the uh, realized genetic gain and you want to put it in the context of time, uh, in essence, you only need at least uh, two years of, uh, uh, of data just to, to derive a, a quick slope. But of course, the more years of data, the, the, the trend becomes more, more robust because it might be that the trend uh, after several years um, is, le is less linear or, or, or the slope is not so pronounced, etc. So uh, as I was mentioning in the recommendations, um, this is not something that, that there is just like a fixed number of years. Uh, I would say, of course, you may want to have at least more than five years to have a robust line there. Um, but on the other hand, the time, it, it really depends on, on what is that particular period of time that you want to investigate or monitor uh, in, in order to see if, if certain things need to be changed. Uh, changed. Um, and on the second question, um, can you repeat that again? Uh, Bish? Yeah, is how do you assign trait weights? Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, that is a completely different question that actually is not related to genetic gain. 
that is mostly on the on deriving indices um and and when you, and it's kind of relevant maybe because the, sometimes you want to calculate the uh, the genetic gain or, or rate of response to selection for an index instead of for a simple trait so when trying to derive an index um you have to assign weights to the traits and there is different methods to do it uh, and, and I will not go in depth, but there is a, 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 another presentation maybe there that Bish can later distribute. And, and is that you can use the, the market intelligence to, to obtain what are the weights for those traits if you have the money to, um, for example, hire one of these expensive firms to do it for you or help you doing it. Um, second, you can look at your historical intelligence and, and check out your data um how the selections have happened in the past and you can actually retrospectively calculate the weights that the breeder is using unconsciously to create the initial weights and then later on you can refine those weights the second uh, the third uh, uh, the third one could be that you actually do not rely on on weights uh, uh, or uh, explicit weights but you just try to improve all the all the traits um depending on the variation. And there is uh, some complex methods there, like the Agen index and, and things like that. Uh, I will stop it there because I think it's a, it's a long topic and, yeah. and that might require a, a different uh, presentation. So we gave recently, actually, together. Sanjay. <laughs> okay. yeah. Thanks a lot, Eduardo. Uh, there's a lot, some, quite a number of questions coming up. Um, we will capture those questions and make sure um, they're answered after the webinar. So thanks everyone for those questions. Thank you again, Eduardo. I know it's, it's quite early for you. I think we started at 6 a.m. in Mexico time. So thanks very much, Eduardo, for joining yeah. us today. Thanks for inviting, um, inviting me. Yeah, thank you. All right. So now we'll move on to the next presentation. So again, uh, a big pleasure to welcome Yung Wa Lee, who is um, based in Korea. So from Mexico, we now shift to Korea. Uh, Yung Wa is the Module 5 lead for Excellence in Breeding, and she's leading the efforts on bioinformatics and, and biometrics. So over to you, Yung Wa. Hello everyone. Uh, sorry, let me just get set up a little bit. Uh, so it's a um, it's a pleasure to uh, give this presentation. It's a first pass a look at some um, data from the Cauro Highland Maze uh, program that um, that some of you may have heard about uh, last week in the EIB virtual meetings. Okay. All right, so for the past year, uh, the Cauro Highland Maze Program has been curating um, their field data from 2002 onwards into um, the breeding management system. So if you would like to uh, hear more about this effort, there is a presentation by um, the breeding lead of the program, Dr. Dixon Ligeo, uh, that is on YouTube. Um, it was recorded as a story of excellence in the EIB virtual meeting, and I included the the links to it over here. Um, this was, I, I believe this is one of the uh, early examples where I, I know that there are many NARS who are in the course of similar um, breeding uh, modernization um, efforts right now, where uh, part of the effort is to digitize their historical data. And it was a real pl pleasure for me to, as a new person in the CGIAR and as a new person and in the, on the EIB platform to um, uh, tr get get my hands on some real data from a, from an active program, and um, also it it was also kind of a chance for me to uh, learn how to use the breeding management system, and uh, and and kind of see from from the user end uh, what the what the system uh, is, is capable of. So uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. All right, um, so let's. This is from uh, Eduardo's uh, manual. The, on how to calculate, on the various ways that you can calculate genetic gain. So um, the, I'm not gonna belabor the, the, the table so much. Um, I just wanna kind of walk through the analysis that the CARO historical data allows us to do. So um, what the analysis that we are going to try to do is uh, we're trying to uh, estimate the realized genetic gain of the program using historical trial information um, and advanced material. And in terms of um, 
uh, connectivity, uh, uh, you'll, you'll see in a bit, but the connectivity for um, Dr. Ligeo's program is actually quite, quite high. Um, let's see. All right, and uh, so one of the advantages of um, digitizing your data is that it lets you kind of take a step back and uh, get and take a bird's eye view of what what you've been doing. Um, uh, so I'm gonna first for the next few slides. I'm gonna have some slides where um, I I try to kind of summarize the the past 17 years in terms of uh, tech strategy and um, some of the basic um, parameters of the breeding pipeline that uh, Dr. Ligeo has been running. So um, first of all, um, we uh, had a fair amount of discussion uh, about, about check connectivity in the past presentation. And um, so if you look at the check connectivity in the Colorado Highland Maze program, um, it's, uh, um, it's actually um, uh, quite high. Uh, I, you, you usually don't see uh, see see this um, in in, uh, uh, in in active reading programs. So uh, what the, the table here is, um, you have the years where uh, there has uh, of the field trials on the on the left, and the over here are GIDs. So those are um, the uh, genetic identifiers for the different um, hybrids. Uh, by which they're called in the BMS system. Um, and uh, some of, I guess, uh, to some of you, th these uh, hybrid names may be familiar. Um, so uh, the, the check strategy in, in Dr. Ligeo has been fairly consistently uh, using um, two, two separate checks, uh, this, uh, this one 614D and this one uh, H6213. It, it, Appears that um, early on, earlier on, it was uh, this 614D was the was the winner to beat, and um, uh, and now it has been replaced <coughs> replaced by H6213. Um, so uh, this um, was something that uh, we can we can take advantage of um, uh, later on. So oh, maybe maybe I'll so. A more, um, a more a more typical thing you might see is uh, sort of a, a, rather than the same check being used for uh, 10 or, or 15 years in a typical um, commercial breeding program where varietal turnover may be a lot faster, uh, what you will usually see is um, checks might turn over every three or four years. Um, so unless you kind of plan ahead uh, as uh, Eduardo and others have uh, talked about, um, it, it may uh, you may uh, lose the advantage of of, uh, of check connectivity in um, to, in making your genetic gain estimates. Okay. So uh, little this is from uh, Dr. Ligeo's talk. Um, uh, so this is this is a, a little bit of detail on, on the um, the check to beat the one that's been in use uh, consistently for the last 10 years or so, H6213. And it is indeed the check to be, that it is, um, uh, it has 48% market share. And, uh, and what, uh, in this, in a part of the modernization push that the Carl Mace program has been doing is to um, define uh, the product profiles and the market segments um, that uh, for, for the program um, guided by uh, this commercial check. Okay. All right. So um, here's the other feature um, in the big pick in, uh, of the program. So uh, the other, the I wanted to see, I wanted to know um, uh, how many years worth of data on average uh, do you have for a particular hybrid that's being tested in the program? And um, uh, what we found was that uh, in the advanced yield trial data, um, there's over the 17 years, uh, the program has tested 339 uh, unique entries, but the vast majority of them uh, were only tested in one year, and a few were tested in um, two or three years. Um, so this oh, looks like, a, I'm sorry, I'm not sure what's going on with the, with the lines that are appearing. But um, okay, so, but uh, the so this part is um, 
not ideal for um, trying to see if there is a genetic trend of improvement. Um, so, uh, so this we'll we'll talk about this a little bit uh, later uh, when we when we're looking at the actual data. Okay. Okay. And um, the fin finally, uh, we looked at uh, we looked at um, checks. We looked at um, how many years of data each entry had. And finally, I wanted to look at um, the 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 usage patterns of the locations. Um, all of these locations, uh, uh, to my understanding, are um, upland, so highland. Uh, Represent representatives of the highland environment. So um, they, they, um, they, they're not differentiated from each other by, by some treatment or anything like that. Um, so uh, there is a, a core set of environment uh, locations that have been in use throughout the years. Um, if you kind of summarize the, the 17 years of the pro past 17 years of the program, on a given year, the program tests anywhere from 20 to 25 entries, um, four to five reps for each entry in five to 11 locations. And, um, and as we saw, uh, most of the entries uh, are tested uh, only, only in one trial, one advanced trial. Um, the other, other thing that uh, came out of kind of looking at the, the uh, looking at the data was that uh, as I was uh, working through this exploratory um, section, I found that uh, there was act there was for um, some of the years, um, uh, specifically from 2008 to 2019, um, the block information <coughs> was uh, missing from uh, from the from the database. So um, in the wh where block information was present, uh, 2002 through 2007, um, usually there would be like three to five um, um, blocks. Uh, but um, he here um, it looked like uh, there had been a, a, a snafu in the data curation effort. So um, so one of the th one of the things that uh, came out of uh, this exploratory first look at the data is that um, let's uh, let's let's find this block uh, number information. Um, so uh, it's because it's missing in a batch, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing it's, it's something uh, like technical having to do with uploading or something like that and not, and not so much that the information is actually missing. So, um, so I think the, one of the <laughs> key next steps that we'll have to do is to work with IBP to find this data and fill it in. Um, incidentally, this is uh, one of the things that I wanted to just kind of point out that um, the, it's hard to kind of see where get a sense of this, the quality of your data curation effort unless you actually start to use the data. So um, uh, as you're do, uh, going forward in your digitization um, program, uh, so I, I would recommend that um, you, you, you know, even, even if it's not like a full analysis, uh, get into the data and do some um, um, exploration of it. And uh, there's um, <coughs> And that, that that kind of iterative exploration is uh, is how how you'll probably figure out uh, what what other things have to be done in your in your curation. Okay. Uh, all right. So um, so now we're here at the recipe to calculate genetic gain for Caro um, Highland Maze. So if let's just go through uh, one through eight over here. The, um, so the, you can see why, uh, looking at this recipe, I uh, spent some time um, doing these uh, big picture exploratory views because that kind of helps me make decisions about how I'm going to look at the data um, and what, what I'm able to do, what I'm not able to do, et cetera. Um, so of course the, the target associated is, is Kenya Highland. Um, the time period of interest is the last 17 years. Um, right now, we're looking at yield. Um, there are many other we can look at uh, further after this. Uh, the um, germ pattern stage sample, the advanced yield trials, um, which has the most, uh, which, which is the biggest and most comprehensive of the data sets that have been digitized. Um, 
the pro uh, production of field data, yep, that's been done. Um, it's been digitized and able to extract it from the BMS database. Um, so uh, what the analysis that um, I think uh, for now um, we're able to do, um, and one of the key things that is a little bit limiting in, in this analysis for now is that um, the, we, the, the lines are generally speaking only tested in, in one year. So uh, we can, we can um, estimate blobs, but you, we're looking at uh, multi-location one year estimates. Um, and uh, now we're gonna actually look, look at some of these blobs. Um, okay, so uh, the, the next few slides, I'm gonna be uh, showing uh, what, what I did in the first pass analysis is the, um, since um, H6213 is the check to beat and it's been used, I think in the last 10 or 11 years, um, uh, of, uh, of the program. I am going to show um, the, the, the blobs for, for a given year uh, relative to um, H6213. So, so for instance, um, this is the first year uh, that H6213 started being used as the, um, as the, as the commercial check in the program. So um, the, the way that you interpret this, uh, this is, these are, you know, 20, 25 lines. Um, here is the blob estimate. Um, I, I believe the, oh, I, I should have put units, I'm sorry. The, I believe the uh, units are uh, 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 kilogram weights. Um, the, so, um, each, so each of these, is a, each of the bars is a, a specific line. And uh, what we're looking at is deviation from the check. And in 2006, when the, when the um, check started, uh, H6213 first started being used, almost all of the, the lines were performed worse than, um, than, that, than that line. Um, okay, so let's march through a few more of these. Um, so here's 2007. Uh, so it looks better than 2006. The the um, you, and you can like look at these exact the same way. The these these ones are beating the um, the commercial check. These ones are not doing so good relative to the commercial check. Okay, but then um, so and and in the early in the early years, it, it like for the most part the lines don't do as well as H6213 and. You know, you have three or four that that uh, that do that do better, um, but then uh, in the middle of the period, you have several years that look like this, um, where, where suddenly uh, all of the all of the lines are doing worse. Um, af before it um, kind of looks, and then you have a year you have a year like this in 2017, where um, it looks it looks really nice. Like the most the majority of the lines are actually in 2017 are beating um, the the commercial check, but then um, last year um, it kind of, kind of went back to this sort of situation where both of them are again not doing as well, and maybe like three or four of them are are beating the check. So um, so I, I, I apologize. I didn't have a I didn't have time to make a. Um, plot that uh, put, puts all of these years uh, together, but um, but you can kind of uh, like kind of see where I'm going with um, with what we're uh, seeing here. Oh, sorry, um, I had another one. <laughs> okay, so you can kind of see where I'm going uh, with the with uh, what um, with what the first pass analysis is uh, telling us. So essentially, it, it, it's hard to tell. It's, it's hard to tell if there is a positive trend of population improvement relative to the commercial check. And um, so it's, I, I, there, are, there are two things that I would like to look further into. For, uh, for instance, um, yeah, let, let's get the block information and um, see if that uh, changes anything. Um, ha not having the information uh, means that we have a, we're, um, we're in, we're, we've introduced a lot of variation that uh, we can't take account of when we're um, doing our estimations. So perhaps that's uh, one of the reasons why uh, we are, it's difficult to spot any sort of trend. Um, but then of course, uh, there's, there's this limitation, uh, the next limitation, which uh, we can't really do anything about. This is the history of the program where, uh, actually, 
we, we may be able to do something about, I'll, I'll I take that back. Um, the, the entries for the advanced yield trials, um, they, it's, it's only one year. So, uh, and, the, and um, uh, realistically, the year to year variation in yield is probably very large. So um, perhaps uh, what we're seeing is uh, just, it's, it's, is that there's just a lot of year to year variation. And right with just this data set, it's, um, we are unable to kind of disentangle um, the, 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 the influence of the year-to-year -year variation from, the, from the, any sort of genetic uh, improvement um, because the, 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 the set, the, the genetics and the years are completely uh, confounded with each other. So um, with just AYT data, it's very hard to, it, it will, we won't be able to um, disentangle it. Okay, so, um, so next, uh, so, there's a, but there, I think there are some things that we um, we want to tr uh, look at next. Um, uh, of course, like I mentioned, there's a lot of other traits, and 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 yeah, I mean it, it's in the database, so let's look at all of them. Um, the I made an, I made the assumption um, when I did the first pass analysis that all the locations were like similar representatives of um, the the Highland environment. Um, but are they? So I, I so uh, I haven't looked systematically at at the at the at the data, but um, but we can because the same sites were um, consistently used throughout the the twenty year time period. Uh, we I think the data is there so that we can uh, make some um, conclusions about about this uh, whether whether these uh, whether there's any sort of structuring in, in the locations that are being used and if there is then um, maybe we can use that information to to try to see if there's any sort of uh, um, uh, uh, trend that we can uh, pull, pull out. Um, and finally, I think this is maybe the most interesting thing to try out um, because it goes at the this uh, uh, limitation here the, that the entries were only tested in one year. So um, the CARO program has not just digitized the AYT data, but they've also digitized the PYT data. So the earlier stages of the of the program, um, it's not as comprehensive. Uh, it, not all the years are available. Um, but but some there are some years available, um, and I have not really looked at looked at what what's there. Um, but I think that given this given this um, this limitation here, the, the that the AYT is uh, just one one year per genotype, uh, it it would be worth going into the PYT data and trying to see if we can um, pull out any um, uh, multi year data for some of the genotypes and and. And uh, remember that what we're trying to do here is trying to see a population trend. So um, yeah, I, it'll depend on what's available, but uh, we don't have to have full information for every uh, for for all of the genotypes to to be able to see a trend if, if there is one. Um, so uh, so this this is definitely something that we should do next and, and explore the PYT data to see if it um, gives us a better data set for. Um, genetic gain estimation, and finally, um, like the, I, I think the there, there's like a lot of value in um, uh, after after digitizing and um, you pull out all of your information and kind of take this bird's eye view of how 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 the testing strategy has been, and um, this gives you a really nice baseline for starting to think systematically about, okay, so uh, what should the testing strategy then be going forward? Um, so, uh, so that is, uh, of course, um, I, I'm sure that the CARO program is already uh, deep into, into, into this. And uh, what any, if there is any kind of um, information that can come out of the historical data, you know, uh, location selection, for instance, uh, to help them in their testing strategy, um, the, they now have the data in the database so that, uh, so that they, can, they can do that. Um, okay, so... I think that was my last slide. I'm, I might have uh, gone a lot shorter than than uh, the than my assigned time, but but yeah. Uh, so that was my last slide. Um, so uh, uh, thank you for listening. Uh, this is obviously a very first pass analysis. So um, I uh, I am excited to dig a little more into it and work with the Caro team to try to interpret um, anything we find. Um, so thanks, and I will take any questions or comments.
Hey, thanks. Thanks so much, Yungwa. Thanks for presenting all that information. And uh, once again, also congratulations to Dixon and his team for um, running such a well-structured program with those common checks and making that information available. I think it's the first uh, national partner in, um, in AGG that is um, undertaking this retrospective analysis. Um, so it is indeed very exciting. So um, I'll go through the chat quickly and, and see, we have a number of questions. Uh, I know Eduardo is helping out and, and answering uh, uh, several of them. Um, maybe we can start with a general question just so that we're all um, clear. So Mulugeta is asking, what, what are ERA trials? Can you just explain you know, the difference between you know, why would someone conduct an ERA trial and what it is? Uh, do, do you want to take it or Eduardo or should I? Um, you, so, you can um, go ahead, Jingua. Or... Okay. Yeah, so it'd be uh, an ERA trial is, um, you, an ERA trial is a way to uh, do a genetic gain estimation without the, so uh, let me, let me uh, kind of maybe find that slide. Um, Okay, so um, so the histor so what we're doing is trying digging through historical data, right? And um, when you're doing that, uh, you need uh, a situation where well, you, well, you need something like this, like many locations tested for um, over a period of time with a check strategy that connects um, connects your your lines over over over, over that period. Uh, the error trial kind of uh, cites a lot of this stuff. Um, in an error trial, you would have your panel of um, lines that you consider like the representative best lines that came out of a particular year of origin. And, and you would have that panel. Um, so that's one the hard thing. The, so, now you don't always have like a, a, a full progression that goes back, you know, 20 years of, um, of, of, uh, of, of advanced lines because uh, you would have had to be maintaining them um, all, the t all this while. So you, you take your panel and you um, uh, plant them all together in one location. And, and, and this gives you a, a consistent data set that you can use to see if over time uh, the, you had um, population improvement uh, in, in what you were advancing. So, uh, do you want to add anything, Eduardo? No, John, I think that was a good explanation. It's kind of a trick to, to generate the data uh, when the historical right. information is not in good shape. So, it's mm -hmm. more expensive, it's, but it's, uh, it can be even more accurate. Um, but sometimes it has mm -hmm. some certain drawbacks. But, um, but yeah, no, nothing else to add. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks Eduardo, thanks Yungwa. Um, I'm seeing several of these questions have been um, answered by um, Eduardo in the chat itself. Um, uh, I'm looking for hands, and if you, oh, uh, something's just come up. Okay, will there be a significant difference uh, in, in using PYT as compared to AYT? So using the you know, preliminary yield trial versus the advanced yield trial data. Mm -hmm. yeah, so um, the way that I would like to use the, the uh, preliminary data is um, that, uh, so, so I, I, I don't know for sure, but uh, presumably there's overlap in the test entries uh, between what was, in the, in the, what was tested in the PYT data set and the AYT data set. So um, if you put the PYT and AYT data set together, uh, you, uh, you would have a multi-year data for some, for some subset of the lines uh, in, 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 in the program. Um, and that might um, help us uh, take into account what probably is pretty drastic year-to-year -year variation in, in yield estimates. Um, so I, I, I think uh, there, there would be a lot of value in looking into that to see if it's possible. Mm -hmm. And if I can add something, you know, uh, I mean, there's nothing wrong also with uh... Uh, mixing some of this information. I mean, you can always decide, okay, I'm going to bring both sources of information together. Um, and, and just to point out, uh, as John was mentioned, maybe this PYT or stage one is tested in less locations with more materials. The AYT or stage two is tested in more locations with less entries. So both actually have the different strengths and weaknesses. The stage one will give you more, more precision in the estimate because you will have a better sample of the population 
uh, whereas the AYT is a smaller sample. So you might be the sampling, uh, the sample, sample is a bit biased maybe, so you will not see it um, as good. Whereas the AYT, because it's, it's tackling more locations or environments that give you a more accurate estimate than it can give you the PYTs. So some programs have decided to just bring all the information to actually come up with what is the, the genetic gain uh, for a particular window, for a particular market segment, but not focus only on the on-farm. Uh, but that's something that you need to really discuss with your stakeholders, because like I said, the, deciding what is the germoplasm stage is an important decision because that will reflect whether you are closer um, to, the, to the situation or environment that your customer will face. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Eduardo. Thanks for those uh, comments. Um, yeah, I'm going through the chat and see a lot of uh, commendations on, on the presentations that you've given you one and Eduardo, people appreciate that. Um, uh, perhaps I can ask you a question, Yung um, uh, because perhaps there might be interest from other national programs to undertake this kind of you know, retrospective genetic gains analysis. You've explained some of the steps, uh, you know, the, there has to be a good structure previously, there should be some commonality with checks and, um, you know, it's, it's quite involving. So uh, what, what would you give as a time estimate? Because we, we know you've been very busy with this. So, you know, for programs who want to start doing some of this, you know, just to warn them, yeah. and kind of lay out how yeah. long this takes. It's not just something you, you know, you click your fingers and then you get some results. So can you just explain that a little bit, how long it's taken and, and the work that went into it? Sure. So, um, so th there were months of, be before I, I ever came into the picture, there were months of digitiz digitization um, by the CARO team and IBP. Um, and that digitization effort is, it's, it's uh, when you're, digitizing historical data, it, it's very painstaking. Um, so, uh, so uh, which is why um, starting to use the data as soon as possible is the best way to uh, figure out uh, wh where you have to go back and fix things. Um, so I'm sure there were, before anything got, got uh, it, there was any uh, way to look at and look at the data, several months of um, uh, data curation and uploading and so forth. Uh, once you, once the data is all in the system, um, BMS, uh, uh, you the main thing that you can do through BMS is um, you can you, uh, you can you can then uh, pull out your your data from BMS um, across all of those years and across all of those locations. And um, that part is pretty pretty easy now um, because it's just uh, you have this very nice interface. Um, it's just uh, some clicks to select your years and your environments and etc. Um, and you'll end up with a bunch of files. Uh, um, I, I believe BMS currently, you can't, may, maybe I'm wrong. I don't think you, you can internally combine years, um, like different, different trials, um, but, uh, but, but, uh, but, that, but that capability would, would be, I think, maybe a, a very nice time saver um, for, to think about in the future. But uh, in any case, the next thing is pull out the data, um, get a bunch of files. The next step is um, the exploratory analysis, and that this part is kind of is fun, is pretty fun, um, and you can do exploratory analysis in really um, any any whatever way you want to do it. Um, I I did it in R because I, that's just the I, what I'm used to using. But um, there are actually you can you can use um, BMS. There there are some exploratory tools within BMS. Uh, that are very nicely documented in the in the manual. Um, if if anyone on the Caro team uh, wants wants me to kind of, uh, one of the things I did was I, I I tried using BMS to do that kind of exploratory data analysis, and and it was it was very straightforward and well documented. And if anyone uh, uh, would like to um, go through that together with me, I'd be very happy to take you through it. Um, so uh, so yeah, next the next part exploratory data analysis because. Uh, it's there's like um, you have to kind of understand the structure of the data set so that you can um, uh, figure out how you're going to try to estimate genetic gain. Um, so, uh, so so then once you figure that out, um, the uh, then then you then the actual like calculation of the bluffs is actually the the easiest part. <laughs> that's that's a uh, you know like it's, but the, everything before that is what takes time like understanding your data is the thing that takes a lot of time. 
Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Yungwa. And, and I mean, for those who are not on BMS, are there some R scripts or software that's open access and available to, to people, uh, to breeders? Yeah. Um, I haven't, so uh, I, I haven't used it myself, but uh, I, I believe the CIMIT team has, uh, has generated, uh, has developed software called Meta R. Um, so I, so I, 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 I haven't used it, so I, I can't really comment on it, but I know that uh, they've, uh, they have uh, done many trainings on how to, how to use it. So um, that might be something to look into. Uh, they've, they have a, established like a workshop that they've given several times, I think, okay. the BSU group at Simit. Okay, good to know, good to know. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Yunhua, and again, thanks for your presentation. I think it's around 10.30 in the in the night uh, for you, so thanks, uh, thanks for joining us at that late hour. Uh, we'll move on to our final presentation of the day, so um, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Yosef Beeni, um, a senior maize breeder with the Global Maize Program in CIMIT. So, uh, over to you, Yosef. Uh, thanks, Fish. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you. We can see your slides. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning and good afternoon. Uh, so, my presentation is on genetic gain in CIMIT maize breeding program in Africa. Uh, I'm just presenting uh, myself and Dr. Prasanna on behalf of uh, a CIMIT JMP colleague in Africa. Uh, so I think so. this is just easy for me because Eduardo uh, mentioned about uh, the breeder equation. Uh, so in our case, in accelerating uh, genetic gain in maize, uh, our target is uh, uh, to develop climate resilient product delivering 1.5 to 2% annual genetic gain per year. Uh, so this is the target we are currently doing in uh, AGG maize. Uh, so um, in terms of uh, uh, just uh, to optimize genetic gain, there is some uh, fundamentals we are currently following in CIMIT. Uh, just one is just experimental design to control uh, plot to plot variability. Uh, that is uh, just to increase uh, selection accuracy, Eduardo mentioned, and also the effective population size in our breeding program. Uh, what is our multi environmental trial uh, to just estimate the true breeding value of uh, our germplasm? And we have a lot of activity in terms of phenotyping uh, to. Um, accurately phenotype for different traits. Uh, I will just uh, talk about a little bit what kind of uh, trait currently we are working and also just to increase the functional genetic diversity. So we'll have uh, um, uh, to increase uh, uh, genetic variability and then reducing cycle time. Uh, so this is uh, just in the next few slides I will just tell you what we are doing and also currently in um, Simit maize breeding program, we want to reduce that uh, cycle time uh, through different ways. Uh, one is we are currently implementing genomic selection for uh, different things. One is uh, for rapid cycle recombination to increase uh, the frequency of favorable allele for a different trait. Uh, the last seven, eight years, uh, we have been using a double haploid. Uh, this is also one way uh, to reduce the time to recall to develop a homozygous line and also we have a lot of off-season nursery uh, currently we can do uh, two to uh, three uh, season uh, per year um, normally we have a uh, two season per year but uh, uh, currently we are also implementing some dryer so that we can do three cycle per year so all of this are um, I'll just mention a little bit uh, one thing is um, uh, just a product profile. Uh, we refine our product profile for Eastern and Southern Africa. Uh, currently, we have three product profile in Eastern Africa and two product profile in Southern Africa. So each product profile have they have own uh, must have and nice to have trait, uh, which just uh, to uh, to satisfy the market segment for a particular region. So uh, you can see on the right side uh, the, the amount of uh, hectare. So we are just serving uh, by this product profile. So, uh, so each product profile we have a must have and a nice to have trait. 
And this is a country we are currently focusing, but there is also uh, a spillover country which can use the material develop uh, within this product profile. And so another important thing is also the testing location, uh, which is very useful to increase genetic gain. Uh, we have, uh, as I said, we have five product profile. Uh, each of them, they have their own must-have and nice-to-have trait. And we have to sample uh, a target, uh, the target population environment to, to conduct our experiment. So we have some in Kenya, uh, some in Ethiopia, and Tanzania, and Uganda. This is for Eastern Africa. And this is a key trait. Uh, for example, in Kenya, we have uh, a, a screening site for managed drought, managed low end, uh, full army worm and MLN. Uh, we have also uh, natural sites uh, across uh, East Africa and our network. So probably just, this is also good to mention. Uh, most of our uh, network is managed by actually in NARS. In, in East Africa, 80% of our uh, trial work is managed by NARS and in Southern Africa, around 50 to 65%. And then this is uh, the product, the market segmentation in the product profile in Southern Africa. We have one for intermediate to late and another one is for early and extra early maturing. Uh, you can see the key traits uh, for yield, uh, agronomic trait, biotic and abiotic stress, and also seed producibility uh, for our uh, uh, advanced material. Uh, and so, in CMIT, so we have uh, this uh, uh, um, a stage gate advancement process. Uh, so we organized our breeding program uh, starting from stage one to stage five. And then, uh, in, so we have also different uh, uh, people specialization. Uh, one is which is focusing on line development. And another team is focusing on the product development. And we have also a seed system specialist. So if you see in uh, the first one, which is a stage one and stage two, this is just managed by line development team in terms of making crosses, uh, evaluating stage one and stage two. And then once the product is advanced from stage two, stage three, uh, the product development team, they will use those material and also they create some uh, coded by coded and stage three and stage four is handled by product development team. And stage five, this is a system team where we evaluate our elite materials on farm. Uh, and then there is a product advancement li licensing and variety release. So currently um, uh, we are recycling line at stage three. Uh, so just from making crosses, uh, you evaluate stage one, evaluate stage two, evaluate stage three, and then you can select whatever percentage of the top uh, line which can be used as uh, a pedigree start. Uh, but um, uh, we have done some uh, work with uh, EIB and Eduardo uh, to just reduce the breeding cycle instead of going stage three to uh, stage two, uh, and the simulation is uh, it is very good. So we are currently uh, uh, try to use some additional data and implement in our product profiles. So in, during as a the stage gate advancement process, so there is a criteria for advancing a particular line hybrid or line or hybrid from one stage to the next stage. So as I said, uh, from stage one to stage two. Uh, this is just managed by line development team. There is a line development breeder, there is a molecular breeder, a phenotyping specialist. So here is just, um, we, and we are currently also uh, implementing uh, genomic selection at, uh, at a stage one. So we estimate the genetic estimate breeding value of a line uh, just to advance some of the line based on only a genotypic data. And here, depending on the product profile, every year we are evaluated around 1,000 to uh, 1,500 lines uh, in each product uh, profile. Uh, the next stage is from stage two to stage three. Uh, this is also 
a line development team. Uh, the only difference here is as uh, a line uh, which is selected from stage one, uh, we will just increase the number of tester and we also increase the number of uh, location and then we just apply some selection intensity to advance it to uh, stage three. So from stage three to stage four, uh, this is where we are doing annual product advancement meeting and all of us uh, will just evaluate the data and then common, we advance those materials which uh, meet a certain threshold for depending on each product profile. And so another thing uh, just to improve genetic gain, uh, we have to also improve uh, our phenotyping site. So we have a group of um, a researcher who is focusing on uh, starting from site selection, optimization, monitoring and improvement. Uh, we have to select a uh, location which is for a particular product profile and then we'll just track what is the variability of particular site and we are also increasing uh, so some of our key location. We are currently uh, using drip irrigation uh, to increase the uh, heritability of uh, a trial. And another activity also is uh, networking. Uh, this is one of the most important in, in CMIT uh, maize breeding program. Uh, so we have um, a network of uh, different sites uh, from uh, Southern Africa to uh, East Africa where we evaluated for uh, drought, uh, and MLN, nitrogen use efficiency and different trades. So our product, our germplasm is evaluated across several locations and our focus is yield is our focus but also uh, yield stability is one of the major important things in our breeding program. Uh, and the second one is uh, we are always updating the protocol, uh, whether it is for drought or low nitrogen or heat, and then data collection uh, methods. So uh, there are several uh, uh, methods currently collecting data. We have some uh, KD Smart, we have field log, uh, so these are currently we are uh, collecting data from the field and it can easily um, move to the database. Uh, so uh, as I said, um, the most important thing is a phenotyping. So if you want to breed for drought, uh, you have to have a drought screening site so that you can easily see the difference between genotype. And if you, for example, the one in your left is in Kiboko, uh, you can see the drought susceptible and drought tolerant. On the right side is uh, Tersicum leaf blight in Kakamega. So you can easily see uh, which one is tolerant and which one is susceptible. And then the MLN, MLN screening uh, at Niversha, you can easily identify which line or hybrid is tolerant and which one is susceptible. And of course, we are also want to see it's not only for stress, uh, in case if there is good favorable um, rain, uh, the particular hybrid also go should be performed under Optima. And uh, so uh, another thing which we, uh, as the last seven, eight years, we integrated DH in our maize breeding program uh, in Eastern and Southern Africa, uh, which definitely increased a lot in our genetic gain. Uh, so we, the last seven years, we have uh, developed uh, 350,000 maize DH line. Uh, each of them is evaluated in stage one, stage two, stage three, uh, stage four, and there is several hybrid released in Eastern and Southern Africa. Uh, so one thing we uh, want to also increase our breeding efficiency is uh, a use of uh, um, uh, markers. So for example, we have now a production marker for maize streak virus. Uh, so this is just uh, uh, currently we are implementing uh, all a new DH line as soon as we generate a new DH line uh, before it goes to stage one test cross. Uh, so our molecular breeder Manje and his team, uh, so they uh, uh, genotype with this three marker and then they will tell us exactly which one is susceptible and which one is uh, resistant. So we only advance the resistant one into stage one. Um, 
Uh, another, the last uh, five to the last probably seven, eight years, uh, we have also evaluated a lot of things in terms of uh, genomic selection. Uh, one is to see, to recombine, especially for drought, to recombine favorable alleles into our germplasm, and we evaluated a different cycle, uh, cycle zero, which is the initial population, cycle one, which is recombined using a marker, and cycle two and cycle three. And if you see, uh, the overall gain is 70 kilograms per hectare per year. Uh, this is under drought. And then if you compare this one uh, with a conventional uh, uh, breeding for drought, you can see there is a, a huge advantage using markers to increase uh, uh, the favorable alley for drought. Uh, another important uh, activity we are currently also mainstreaming is uh, the, you know, the, the use of genomic selection to predict untested lines. So this one is, as I said, uh, uh, every breeder, every, every year, uh, will, he will have uh, around 3,000 DH line. So you can't phenotype all of them. So currently we are implementing uh, phenotyping uh, half of uh, the line and then predicting the remaining half. So what we showed here is if you uh, advance line based on only the genetic estimate breeding value and also advance based on, based on stage one phenotype, uh, we evaluated together. You can see the one which is in the circle is whether it is advanced based on phenotypic selection or genetic estimate breeding value the mean yield in stage two in common trials is almost the same. And this is also the same for drought. But one important thing here is the cost. If you see the cost of um, uh, genomic selection and phenotypic selection, that is almost, you can reduce up to 32% of the total cost. So uh, currently uh, we are just implementing this one in Eastern and Southern Africa product profile. And uh, uh, another important thing is uh, in the collaboration also with EIB and um, uh, in the previous one is Gobi. I think now it's probably become EIB. Uh, so just to, to uh, integrate the phenotypic and the genotypic data uh, into uh, a, a database so that we can uh, implement either forward breeding or genomic selection. So that is currently ongoing. And um, the last is not but least is about uh, our seed system. Uh, seed system is also one of uh, the important, uh, one of the important um, activity. Uh, it's not only the yield, uh, what about the seed production? So our seed system team, they will characterize the lines, they will characterize the single cross and just to identify which is the best single cross in the line that can reduce the cost of goods sold. So this is activity is currently then both in Eastern and Southern Africa. So uh, after just now, the, the next um, few slides, I will show you uh, what is the genetic gain assessment currently used by CIMIT maize breeding program. Uh, the first one is ERA study. I think it's all um, mentioned by the previous speaker. This is just uh, to evaluate hybrid released or developed in different years together in a common field trials. So if you want to evaluate your breeding progress for the last 10 years or 15 years, you have to uh, bring those hybrids and just put in a common field trial. Uh, this is useful, uh, as Eduardo mentioned, it is a straightforward but the problem is it is expensive. Uh, first of all, you have to generate um, as a seed for each hybrid released in different years. Uh, and then uh, uh, conduct a separate trial. So uh, this is uh, expensive. Sometimes you might not get also a seed for as an older variety. Uh, the second one is, uh, which is uh, uh, mentioned by <coughs> uh, the previous speaker, is about the historical or long-term yield trial. Uh, so 
Uh, this is useful, uh, especially for breeding program uh, with a long term history. If you have a data for the last couple of years, that is a normal yield trial data. Uh, you can do also uh, the <clears throat> genetic gain study. I will show you uh, an example for both. The third one is it is not actually a genetic gain study, but you can monitor your uh, breeding progress uh, simply by adding a new uh, hybrid or a commercial check in your breeding program. And then you compare uh, what is your breeding program uh, progress compared to the established commercial hybrid. So this one is easy to do uh, just to see whether you have good germplasm that can beat the best hybrid in the market. So uh, one study, uh, which is an ERA study, uh, this is um, the one which is done both in Southern Africa for early and extra early, and another one is for medium maturity in East Africa. So this is uh, the ERA study uh, in Southern Africa is for the last 18 years from 2000 to 2018 in Eastern Africa for nine years, starting from 2008 to 2016. Uh, we included some uh, commercial check. Uh, this is the number of interim. And then here is the management group. Uh, so we have an optimum. Uh, we have random stress, uh, drought, low end. And then it is evaluated both by uh, NARS and also private seed company. Uh, so this is, let me show you so this is a one for uh, Southern Africa for early maturing the last 18 years. Uh, so this is the one uh, in an era study you can see. Uh, this is uh, the mean uh, when they started uh, in 2000. Uh, the mean is around 6.8 ton per hectare. And the annual genetic gain is around 123 uh, kilogram per, per year. Uh, and then the, um, the percentage of genetic gain is around 1.81%. If you remember my first slide uh, for this project, currently we are working, uh, we said from 1.5 to 2%. And then for random stress, uh, this is, um, you can see the mean yield when we start the project is around four tons and the annual genetic gain is around 75 uh, 76 kilogram per hectare per year and the genetic gain is around 1.83 percent and for low, low nitrogen stress uh, this is also the same you can see a good uh, genetic gain around 64 kilogram per hectare per year and then the initial is around three ton uh, slightly less than three ton per hectare and the genetic gain is around 2.17 and you can see the heritability of the trial and then uh, for drought stress, uh, it's also the same trend. Uh, you can see around 63 kilograms. So if you see for drought, managed drought, and low nitrogen is almost comparable. For optimum, slightly higher. You can just, yeah, you can expect that. And then this is actual, uh, uh, <clears throat> the absolute value, but in terms of percentage, you can see it. And then for this one is, um, random drought. So this is just for um, intermediate for uh, Eastern Africa. Uh, so for example, if you see this one is just, just two kinds of the same data, but if you include the checks, because we included the check, if you are the baseline is your check, the genetic gain is very high. But if you start the now, okay, your base material, uh, base source population is your material in 2013, the genetic gain is around 131 kilogram per hectare. It's almost the same as in Southern Africa for optimum. And you can see the percentage genetic gain is around 1.7%. For drought, also the same thing, uh, around 79 kilogram per hectare. Uh, this is also the same as in the Southern Africa, around 65 kilogram, uh, kilogram per year per hectare. And so that is just for the hybrid. We also have done for inbred lines. Uh, so this is a, a total of 124 inbred lines developed during different years from 1996 to 2013. So this is a, 
the details of the line. The line is evaluated together uh, at six sites in Kenya and Uganda. You can see uh, we have around 39 or 40 kilogram per hectare for our inbred lines. So the second, um, the one which is mentioned is the, the, the first one I showed you an example is a ERA study, uh, but we have also then the historical regional trial data. Uh, so what we have done here is uh, for Eastern Africa breeding pro program, we just picked the, for example, the, uh, the regional trial for, uh, sorry, a regional trial for early maturing starting from 2011 up to 2017. Uh, this is the management is drought. You can see the number of trials, uh, the number of replication, the heritability for each. And then if you just see um, the regression line, just using uh, a blob C that is just adjusted to uh, based on uh, the, the check, which is uh, always there from 2011 to 2017, you can see uh, is around 68 kilogram per hectare per year. So this one is actually, if you see the one I said previously, uh, here is uh, around 79. And then the previous one for drought is 64 kilogram per hectare. So this is the era study, but from uh, the ongoing uh, historical data, you can see that it's not much far. It's uh, just around 68 kilograms per hectare per year. For optimum, uh, so this is the number of trials. Uh, you can see in some cases there is 31 location, 21 line. This is the heritability and the genetic, the estimated genetic gain is around 98 kilogram, uh, kilogram per hectare per year. Uh, and the, another one is that the one I said is just if you don't have that one, just a simple and a quick one is just to, co to compare with your best material. So when you evaluate your material, you include the best commercial check and see what is if you if you advance your advancement rate is 10%. If you take the 10% of your pre-commercial hybrid and then compare over the check and this one you can see under optimum and under drought. This is expected because we focus, uh, our major focus is breeding for the stress. Under optimum also we have reasonable yield advantage compared to the best check in the trial. Um, another one, the one which uh, Eduardo mentioned is also, here is uh, an example uh, of uh, the population mean for different years. Uh, so we, uh, MLN, I think most of you, especially in East Africa, you know this is a viral disease. Uh, so what we did, uh, we started breeding around 2011. So every year, uh, just we identify a baseline and then evaluate make crosses and develop a DH line. So uh, this is the total de number of DH line in 2014, 16, and 18. Uh, in total, 5,000 evaluated in Naivesha. So this is a MLN score. Uh, one is, is being uh, tolerant or resistant and nine is susceptible. And it's just we put a check, uh, susceptible check mean both in 2014, 2016 and 2018, they are just between seven and eight. This is a score for susceptible check. If you see the mean in 2014, the mean is around uh, slightly above six. Okay, the mean of uh, this 2,876 lines. And in 2016, uh, just we moved the mean slightly to the left to uh, tolerant and resistant. And in 2018, we also moved again uh, the mean. So this shows you, if you do uh, population improvement, just select the best material, make crosses, and then uh, develop DH line or pedigree. So you can see uh, how you can move the mean. And uh, another one is yes, we also, because um, we also evaluate our uh, best material compared to check in the farmer's field. And so farmers also uh, evaluate our material. You can see here the, the, the commercial check, uh, which is currently, this is the early maturing uh, marketed in Eastern and Southern Africa compared. We have internal genetic check here. We have internal genetic check and this is a, 
uh, uh, recently released or uh, allocated hybrid. You can see overall evaluation by the farmer yield and early maturity. So this shows you that um, the genetic gain we just observed under uh, on station trial also translated to on farm trial. And this is my last slide. So this is just to show you, this is a, a amount of uh, certified seed production from cement derived variety uh, from 2014, 2019 in Eastern and Southern Africa for different country. You can see uh, the amount of seed production in metric ton is significantly increases uh, from 2014, 2019. So, uh, our hybrid, uh, which is marketed by a seed company, also uh, farmers are buying and the seed production is increasing uh, from year to year. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Bish. Thanks a lot, Yusuf. Uh, very comprehensive presentation and uh, uh, thanks for sharing all those details. It looks like the SIMIT team has been very effective and uh, very aggressively attacking the genetic gains equation from all angles. and and it's, it's, start, it's showing a lot of dividends in your genetic gains. Um, we're almost out of time, so I think we'll take one question from the chat. It's come from Geraldo, uh, and he's asking, um, is, uh, is the blop a measure of deviation between the hybrids and the check yield used in the different years on the historical trials? Um, is that question clear for you, Yosef? It's it's not very clear to me. Do you understand it? Yeah, that yeah, that that is that is yeah, that's correct. This a blob C is yeah. This is this is the, the deviation. So in every, for example, in two thousand eleven, uh, you have the check mean, uh, and then an individual entry mean in two thousand twelve, and so that you have the grand mean for the check, and so what you do is now for each entry. Uh, you have that the blob and then you reduce you minus the mean of for that particular a uh, particular year and then you uh, add the 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 grand mean so that is the one which is just is useful to to calculate the genetic gain from uh, from uh, historical data okay, thanks Yosef. Um, I, I have a brief one from my end. You, you've shown some very impressive genetic gains figures here. So with all the new changes that you're now incorporating, do you expect the, the gains to rise even further in the future? Or do you think the, the, you, you're reaching some kind of a plateau? Uh, yeah, Prasanna, can I give you or can I go ahead? Because Prasanna is my, my co-presenter. I, I think he had to drop off um, uh, okay. halfway through our webinar today. Yeah, for another call. Um, oh, okay, that's fine. I think Bish, if if you see, if you see, okay, the genetic gain, uh, the percentage, it looks like a little bit higher or is acceptable. But if you see the absolute value of the mean yield of our hybrid, so I think by implementing some of uh, the new method. Uh, I think we can still increase uh, increase the genetic gain. Um, uh, so currently, we are um, aggressively uh, introducing some functional diversity from XTPVV material, and uh, uh, we have evaluated. I think there is a there is a, a potential to increase yield potential and uh, plant architecture. So by implementing different ways of um, if you reduce uh, Definitely, if you reduce the breeding cycle, uh, the cycle time, you can increase genetic gain. So there is a lot of a scope uh, for, for improvement. Okay, that's just very encouraging to hear. Okay, once again, thanks very much, Yusuf. Thanks very much for this presentation. Really very much appreciated. Thank, um, thanks. So now we're coming towards the end of the webinar. Um, so um, Dominic Karanja is assembling all the PowerPoints. Uh, and he will distribute them uh, to all the attendees. Uh, there will also be a YouTube link uh, for those who would like to follow the presentations again uh, on YouTube. So we would like to especially thank many of the national partners who have joined the call today. Uh, I think at one point we had about 140 participants uh, on the webinar. So thanks very much for making time for this. We look forward to working with many of the national programs on AGG in 2021. 
um, uh, to conduct um, you know, retrospective genetic gains analysis and support your programs to make improvements in, uh, in genetic gain uh, going forward. Um, a special thanks to Dominic Karanja, uh, who organized uh, this entire webinar. So thank you very much, uh, Dominic. Uh, and thank you very much to Adam Hunt too. Uh, Adam Hunt is the new uh, head of communications for excellence in breeding, uh, and he has been offering a lot of support to uh, share information about these webinars. Um, so before we close, I'd just like to invite John Derrera uh, maybe to share a, a final comment uh, before we close the webinar. So I'd like to hand it over to you, uh, John. Uh, thanks, Ish. I hope you can hear me. Uh, we can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to say a few words here and say this was a very uh, productive uh, webinar. And for this reason, I would like to thank the presenters uh, for organizing this kind of information that they've delivered in just two hours. It's not just gone into that. Uh, it has been very informative and I'm sure quite inspiring. Inspiring greatness indeed. You can see by the way the audience has been engaging uh, through very important questions throughout that there is a lot uh, that to be taken home. And also the fact that at one point you have more than 130 participants, on average more than 120 participants, shows a high level of attendance, which is quite effective and impactful. But most importantly is the nature of the presentations which touched on the reviews the methodology that has been used uh, to generate data for genetic gain and also presenting the historical data showing how much our genetic gain has been realized uh, to date. I'm sure this sets uh, a very good baseline uh, for the breeding program, national programs uh, across the continent. The finding that at least uh, there's about 2% genetic gains is quite inspiring because we want to do better. So most importantly, during the discussions and the nature of questions that we're coming through, it really shows that there are several ways we can do uh, to make further gains, to increase it beyond uh, the 2%. This vary from engaging in smart processes, in selecting parents for future crosses, and also looking at the quality of the testing network, uh, which best represents the, the target environment where the farmers or the end users who have the products. So I see that as very important. Again, also the presentation of benchmarks, especially in historical data, shows us that as we design our testing going forward, we have to take care of getting the very important benchmarks so that in the future, we will be able to measure genetic gain very effectively. Otherwise, I thank everyone else uh, for taking part in this. We enjoyed it, it was quite rich. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much for those warm words, John. And, and yes, once again, thank you to all the speakers, to John, Prasanna, Yungwa, Eduardo, and Yosef. Thanks very much. So on behalf of Dan Makumbi and myself, we thank you once again for your participation uh, and look forward to seeing all of you soon in another webinar. Thank you very much and goodbye.